So this leads me to my last point about monetary policy, and that is in order to capture the benefits of such a policy, the public must believe that policymakers will stick to their goals, stick to their rules, and their commitment to achieve them. If policymakers fail to act in a way consistent with their stated <coughs> objectives, credibility is lost, the public becomes uncertain about how policymakers will react in the future, and from my perspective, that's surely a recipe for volatility, not stability. This is one reason why transparency is so important. When policymakers are transparent about how they're setting policy, the public can verify whether policymakers are acting in a way that's consistent with those objectives. In doing so, we gain credibility and the economy gains stability. Now, just as we choose to pursue a systematic policy in conducting monetary policy, I think we have to apply that, those same principles of sound policy making to the central bank's responsibilities for financial stability, particularly its role as a lender of last resort. In light of this crisis, academics, policymakers, and many others are taking much greater interest in this thing called a lender of last resort than we did. Of course, an early guide to systematic policy or lender of last resort policy really dates back to the late 19th, late 19th century and Walter Badgett's simple rule of lending freely to solvent, solvent banks at a penalty rate against good collateral. Yet during this past year, the Fed and the Treasury, but mostly the Fed, has taken extraordinary actions to ensure financial stability and have gone be far beyond this simple Badgett principle. Some of these actions have supported markets in which intermediation was severely impaired. Others have, sub have supported the ongoing survival of institutions deemed too big to fail. Financial market conditions have continued to improve over this last year. We're all thankful for that. However, I believe that abandoning Badgett's simple rules has fostered a great deal of moral hazard and runs risks for our financial system in the future. Because a financial crisis of this magnitude doesn't occur very often, at least in the United States, we had not as much experience in dealing with the crisis as perhaps we should. As events moved quickly, we ended up learning as we went. So it's probably not surprising that policy reactions appeared at times erratic rather than systematic. Yet in the process, I think we've learned that not having a clearly articulated and communicated systematic approach to our lending that covers both bad and good times can be fusing to the, to the public and to markets. Of course, this was, under, this was underscored uh, by the public and market reactions to the Fed and Treasury's varying approaches in 2008 to the serious problems that arose in three financial firms, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and the insurer AIG. The lack of a clearly understood approach to the government's and the Fed's decisions about when assistant efforts would be provided created confusion and uncertainty. Now a significant factor contributing to that difficult policy choices was the lack of what we refer to as a resolution mechanism for the orderly failure of what some people might believe as systemically important non-bank financial firms. In fact, 18 months after Bear Stearns, we still don't have such a mechanism. The lack of a well-articulated systematic approach to the Fed's lending contributed to uncertainty in financial markets about who would be rescued and who would not. That uncertainty still remains today and has to be one of the prime objectives of policy going forward. I believe that no firm, no firm should be too big to fail and that somebody other than the Fed, actually, should have the authority to fail these firms, wipe out shareholders, their stakes in the firms, force uninsured creditors to take haircuts, and unwind them in an orderly manner. The key, in my view, to placing the moral hazard that we've opened Pandora's box with, of getting that moral hazard back in the box, a resolution mechanism has to be one piece of that battle. Now, of course, the real challenge in such an approach is whether a policymaker can make a credible commitment to actually do what needs to be done. Won't there always be firms that are going to gamble on a rescue in something like a game of chicken with the government? 
Does it, will this really eliminate moral hazard? The answer to the both problems is yes, there'll be some firms that are going to gamble. No, it doesn't completely eliminate moral hazard, but it's likely to substantially improve the situation. As the crisis unfolded and problems arose in different parts of the financial system, the Fed responded by trying to increase liquidity in several markets through special lending programs. These programs may, may have had some stabilizing effects on markets and may have lowered some spreads in certain financial markets. Yet without defining in advance a systematic and consistent approach to such lending, these programs also raise their own form of uncertainty. In this case, it was about who or who would not have access to these various facilities. This was illustrated in the term asset-backed securities loan facility, one of the many acronyms called TALF. When that was announced, many market participants immediately began lobbying the Fed and Treasury for expanding the categories of securities eligible for the program. Everybody wanted in. So did these multiple lending programs keep lenders on the sidelines waiting to see which class of assets the Fed would include in their programs? Did we improve markets quickly or did we drag out the turmoil or just delay the healing process? In hindsight, the basic problem was in our desire to get financial markets working again, we offered no systematic view as to how and where the Fed would intervene. We lacked a well-articulated systematic approach. Moreover, we strayed into credit allocation, which in my view is fiscal policy and rightly does not belong with the central bank. Now going forward to promote a clearer distinction between monetary and fiscal policy and help safeguard the importance of the Fed's independence, I've advocated on a number of occasions that the Fed and the Treasury should agree on a new accord, that the Treasury should take all of the non-Treasury assets and non-discount window loans from the Fed's balance sheet and exchange them for Treasury bills. Such a new accord would transfer the funding of these special credit programs from the Fed to the Treasury. The Treasury would then have to issue Treasury securities in exchange for them with the Fed. Thus ensuring that these extraordinary credit policies are under the, under the oversight of the fiscal authority, not the Fed. That's where they rightfully belong. The accord would return control of the Fed's balance sheet to the Fed so that it can, it can continue to conduct monetary policy in a more independent, more neutral fashion. I would actually go even further and suggest that the Fed adopt what I would call an all-treasuries policy for the securities that are held on our balance sheet and then follow Badgett's principle for the loans on its balance sheet. That is, the Fed would lend only to solvent firms with good collateral at a penalty rate. We must specify in advance the conditions under which the central bank and the government will serve as a lender of last resort. Again, it should be systematic, should apply in both good and bad times, and have clear and realistic and feasible objectives associated with it. Developing such a policy is not easy. Making credible commitments to stick to such a lending policy in good times and bad is even more difficult. But nevertheless, that is what we must do if we are to tackle and achieve better, better results in the next crisis. So in summary, going forward, I think the Fed, as well as other policymakers, should strive to follow a more systematic rule-like approach, both in good times and in bad. Developing and implementing such systematic rules for making sound policy in all seasons deserves far more attention by policymakers than has been given, because I think it would yield better outcomes, both for monetary policy and for financial stability. In times of crisis are the precisely the right times when sound principles and good foundations are most important. Thank you very much.